time because I really saw this entertaining presentation and now a German guy, a German guy from a boring insurance company tries to explain you what we are doing. Yeah? And with such an entertaining presentation, it's always tough to follow. Um, what I like to do, and first of all, I have to apologize a bit because I think you listened to Andreas Nolte this morning, so I might repeat some of the elements that he was saying, so sorry again for that. Um, I want to take you a little bit on a journey. I want to take you on a journey that we as a very traditional company made to really think about our transformation. And what you see, <laughs> see with the slides um, and what we'll tell you is, is really German. Uh, I mean, we do everything very structured. So when we go into such a transformation, we look around ourselves, what is happening, we reflect on ourselves, we are standing, and then we do kind of a program. So, and what you're gonna see is exactly this journey. So when we looked outside the world, we saw actually this. It's actually, if you look at it, the transformation is happening. And if we compare ourselves with the financial peers, it's actually a little bit of difference to the banks and the insurance companies. While with banks, you already have seen a large degree of disruption, this is not yet there with insurance companies. I think one of the key drivers is probably that banks have naturally more interaction with their customers, and therefore it was probably easier for startups to disrupt and go into the value chain. So that was the outside world. So there's disruption out there. Other financial peers are more affected than we are, but the storm is rising. So that was the outside look. But then we looked at ourselves internally. I th would kind of bet that if I talk to some of my colleagues from similar companies like ours, this might sound familiar with you. So you're used to a waterfall approach, thinking in boxes, and then you have a hierarchy to it. While if we see where we should go, it's actually be far more agile and really be faster. I mean, agile for us is actually two things. Being faster, but also more customer-centric and develop code that really matter for the customer. So again, you know, we understood the way. We tried to understand what is actually happening in the outside world again. So, you know, we have the tech companies out there. We have also in the insurance field some of the startup disrupting it. And our core question was, what do we learn from that? And actually, I will now show you the summary of what we learned, and I want to highlight a couple of aspects. I mean, first of all, that was just our takeaway. There are probably academics out there, people much smarter than us, who can give you another you know, kind of categorization. But that was our key takeaway, and it works um, quite well for us. So first of all, what you have to think about this whole transformation is, it's actually not about IT. There are a lot of things that are actually business developments that are triggered by some IT innovation, but it's not about IT. You know, if you look at some of the companies like Apple, how they are really passionate about customer experience, this is not per se IT, it just, you know, it coincides. If you look at lean principles that were out there already before, if you think about you know, slicing bigger investments into, you know, um, um, shorter amounts of times. This was coming from venture capitalists already for quite a while. Huh? And co-location is actually something you can do all the time. Huh? Then, of course, you have very specific technological developments. You have um, agile programming and you have elastic infrastructure that you can build on. Actually, I don't know, again, you know, you know, you know colleagues from uh, other incumbents, it's always funny to talk about Agile. Um, and I will later say a work, word also on it. Um, when I now talk within the company, I become a huge buzzword. And actually, very often, I run into, you know, you run into a situation that is a little bit ca chaotic, and somebody said me, tells me, oh, don't worry, we do it in an Agile way. And then we always have to explain them, you know, look, Agile is actually a very structured approach. You know, it's not about, you know, chaotic behavior. But, you know, this was the reflection that we had. And um, then we were actually quite happy to say there are elements which we can build on, especially the lean startup approach um, um, that was um, um, made popular by um, Eric Ries 
and where we are also in partnering up with Pivotal to see how we can introduce it in our company. So how does it look like? What we're currently doing is we have these six levers that are important to us, and we have put that in a something called digital factory. So the digital factory actually has a certain element of steering, because like each and every, um, if, you, if you compare yourself with AVC, you need kind of a funnel management, what kind of projects do you do, you know, what is the strategic value behind it, how do you achieve this value. And then we have this so-called training center or garage, where the people are actually working, co-located in an agile manner. We have next to that also a company called Kaiser X Labs, which is focusing on UX design. It was an internal company which became part of um, Allianz Germany um, just recently. And then we obviously collaborate with the global digital factory because we also have a digital factory on a global level. We are a global company or we are part, we as Allianz Germany are part of a global company. And there are a lot of things where can, we can share developments across countries. So that is um, how it looks like. What I think uh, was already alluded to, we also thinking about minimum viable products because it's all about quickly learning on what is working and what is not working. And we actually want to uh, introduce our discipline to say, what do we actually want to um, um, achieve? So like the MVP proposal. So what is it? What, you know, what is the question we address? You know, what do we want to achieve? What is the customer problem we want to solve? Then people get, our teams get money to work for roughly 100 days. And then we look uh, again, you know, what have we realized? Was it successful or not? And then our, we have created something called a review board, which then looks as, you know, can we go live with this? Do we have to improve or do we have to pivot? So now, how does it really look like? And there's one colleague later, he can, you know, I don't know, with a beer, share you um, some real life experience that it looks like um, and how it is to work. We actually introduced co-locations, open spaces. Um, we have them in Stuttgart. Um, um, this is one of our major locations, um, roughly 90. Um, I think they were opened end of June. And we have them in Munich, where people really um, work co-located, on the ground, focused on the concrete delivery. There are no telephones at the working place, so that they can really focus on development which these kind of settings we put a little bit aside of, um, of our regular headquarters to really give the team a little bit the environment to work on the concrete problems. Because what we see is that, you know, with all these different hierarchies, functions, if you're very functionally differentiated, teams get up often disturbed and don't have the chance to really work on the end product. And very often, these you know, um, departments, they don't do it out of bad intentions. It's just how we used to work. As I said, one of the key elements is um, agile development, which we do together with um, Pivotal. Um, this is actually um, um, a slide that we use also internally um, to explain it. And again, the very first point, I think I mentioned it earlier, is always to say, look, this is a, you know, a proven approach. It's not about managing chaos, because sometimes people just say, oh, let's be agile, and then you know, it's actually just another word for chaos. I think if you look at this, we started on this journey, but we still have to get better. Huh? This is the principle, and we, we now have to still stick with it. Part of it, we also now investing into what is called elastic infrastructure. We labeled it that way. Because, of course, in this kind of environments, especially if you have things in the, um, in the customer facing layer, you want to actually implement bring time to market in a, in a very rapid manner. This is how it looks like, you know, on a simplified way on our side. We still have, of course, our core insurance and backend layers. You have to imagine what this insurance is about. Huh? This is long-time business. I mean, somebody buying a life insurance policy 
at the age of, let's say, 28, you know, might turn it into a new T, and then, you know, this person has it until his death. So it's 70 years. 70 years. You have this kind of policy, and those are in our systems. Yeah? So this is why we still need quite a very stable system who keep the basic data on, on, on this area. But then we are investing in a customer-facing part um, where you exactly have this interaction layer for customers, but also to introduce um, very quickly new developments. And to manage that, we introduce an, uh, an integration layer that actually creates a connection between these two speeds. That was now the quick part. Now, listening to, to uh, my pre-speaker, I was quite impressed, especially with the, with the reference to the matrix. So I thought, gee, I cannot end on this slide because you know it's high level. It's probably kind of boring for you. So what I would like to do is um, to share with you some philosophical thinking why we think we're on the right way. And when I was in charge in my previous job, very often in transformation projects, and then usually IT transformation was one element out of it, among many others. And always the trans IT transformation part was the one with the hassle. And I sat back, you know, why is this the case? I really wanted to understand it. Why is this the case? And then I started to reflect, and as I also did uh, some studies in philosophy, I, sometimes it's it worth opening books that are 2,000 years old. And that's actually, um, um, it's Plato and that Aristotle gave me some, you know, help to understand it. And sometimes it's quite, you know, easy if you think about it, or some are quite simple. If you think about code, code is actually very easy. It's logic, logical, it's always logical, you know, it's always an if-then combination, whatever. And it's always explicit. It's always explicit. There's no hidden message if you want so. You know, you write something that's even. But if you look into human systems, human organization, they're neither logical uh, nor explicit. They're implicit. Whenever I go to, you know, where the clerks sit, it's always interesting to see the kind of post-its they put on their screen. Uh, because this is how the real processes run. But if you think about a waterfall approach and you ask people to do, write down these requirements, they would usually never have the idea to write down these kind of requirements that they, for example, need a screen where they can put their post-its on or something like that. So there's a lot of implicit knowledge out there. And this is why Agile really helps you. All this helps you to really very quickly, it's actually more human, you really very quickly make the things transparent what are you working on? And you, you acknowledge that things are not always logical and are not always explicit. And this, and this is what I want to end with, was actually the discussion with Plato and Aristotle. While Plato had the idea to say there's an ideal world, you know, with, you know, we just have to get it right. We just have to understand, you know, um, 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 this ideal world and write it down, actually. Aristotle said, no, this is probably not the case. Um, if you think about it in the, in, the, in the world, there are things that are always as they are, but some, some things, especially in the human world, are actually most of the time so, but some some uh, different. So coming back, and this, you know, um, I wanted to provide with you, was maybe a little bit of a philosophical underpinning, why I think this approach is really helpful because it acknowledges that the things that we do, and if we look at the transformation that are ahead of us, are neither fully logical, nor are they always explicit. So you have to put a lot of thinking to take the people uh, along with you on the journey, so that they understand what it is about, that they feel part of it. And we hope, and this is coming back to what I've presented to you. With our digital factory, we, we've actually built an environment where we can really push this transformation from a business development side, so maybe that's the logical part, and a technological side. Thank you. <laughs>